<laughs> no, but, but really, it's completely true. She asked for a funny fact, and I was like, well, this is what I look like <laughs> until just a few days ago. Um, I don't know. Maybe I could have come up with something funnier, but that's what was on top of my mind. Um, <laughs> Uh, I asked a friend, what should I, uh, how should I start my, my presentation? And she said, maybe you should start with a question. And uh, so I, my question for you is, um, does anybody recognize any of these networks? If you recognize one of these networks, can you raise your hand? OK, and then take it down when it comes off. <laughs> yeah, they're all your networks, actually. <laughs> These are all networks you've attached to recently. <laughs> okay, well that's cool. So like about half the audience. Any good ones? Bell Wi-Fi. La 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 lapin. That's nice. Art Java. Okay, so that's a good question. Now I have a feeling for you guys. Maybe I can ask some better, some better questions. Okay, let me let me ask some better questions. How many of you write code? All right, great. You're in the right presentation. <laughs> how, how many of you draw in a sketchbook? OK, good, good. How many of you call yourself designers? A few people? Come on, it's a good term. Artists? That's, we need even more people raising their hand. Programmers? All right. I like that people cluster together. Directors? A couple people. Producers? Managers? Where are students? A bunch of people, yeah, make it work. Something else. <laughs> good, good. All right, how many of you are in the front? How many of you are in the back? How many of you are half the audience? Not, not bad, that was pretty good, that was pretty good. That's probably the best, time, the best response I've seen to that one. It takes a programmer to figure that one out. <laughs> okay, so let's get started. Um, again, my name is Kyle McDonald. This presentation is called Do It With Everyone. Um, I was showing you just some of those wireless SSIDs because it's something I've been thinking about a lot recently. I think a couple days ago someone actually gave a, a talk on it, but I, I, was, I missed it. I didn't realize that the talk was happening. Oh. <laughs> this is what your card does when it's in monitor mode. Kind of freaky, right? Let's turn that off. Um, I got started uh, kind of writing code in a sort of art space with processing in about 2003. Um, this is what the processing website looked back like back then. Uh, actually, this was a little after I got it. When I got it, you couldn't even download processing. You had to email the people who made it, and then they'd decide whether to send you a copy or not. <laughs> um, but I begged them, and I said, I've been writing Flash. Please, please let me write something better than ActionScript. Um, I was amazed because the community was so supportive and I felt like um, I'd, I'd found like a new way of working. I mean, I was just finishing high school and I'd been trying to do creative things, but like I didn't really understand uh, how I could be creative like successfully. And when I started working with other people and kind of small community like processing, um, I felt much more comfortable. Like there was other people supporting me and I was there to support other people. Sometimes I had some technical expertise or they did um, and we could all kind of give each other advice and ideas. Um, I started uh, working with this more in a physical space with Instructables later, where I would post a ton of um, uh, tutorials to Instructables about like physical stuff, like hardware, you know, how to build force sensing resistors or 3D sensors, um, or like use an Arduino to make a guitar uh, pedal, or weird instruments that make glitchy noises. Um, and this is when I started realizing that, like, uh, at this point, when I tried to separate, like, the work I was making versus the discussion, you know, the work I was doing was here at the top of the page, right? This is where my content is. But then at the bottom, this is the discussion. And invariably, you know, I should have noticed it before on the processing forums, but invariably, the discussion is always the dominant thing. The discussion is the place where people get the most from each other. It's not from you know, the individual artifacts that you create or the tutorials you write, but actually people are learning from each other and giving each other ideas. Um, and yeah, you can see it's like you know, the top 20% is what I'm contributing and the bottom 80% is what is really going on. Um, uh, 
So these are, yeah, <laughs> it kind of continued with the Open Frameworks community in 2008. Um, so after working with some processing people and Instructables people, um, I started working with people who are making open frameworks. Does anybody write open frameworks code in here? A few people? Cool. So uh, who, who mostly does back-end development? Another question. Okay, who mostly does front-end development? All right. And who does, like, installation work? All right, cool. So there's some other stuff besides open frameworks out there. There's a lot of great environments for doing installation stuff. Um, but OF is the community that I got into. Um, and I was, as I was working with uh, OF, I saw this trend of people kind of making uh, toolkits like within OF that uh, they thought were cool so that they could accomplish some interesting technical feat that furthered their creative vision. And what I was interested in at the time was 3D scanning and sensing. Um, so I started developing some 3D scanning toolkits. Uh, this was 2009, maybe t two years before the Kinect came out, I think. Um, so kind of glitchy, <laughs> but it only needed a projector and a camera. So you could do this real-time 3D scanning to make um, this kind of crazy point cloud mesh animations. Um, and anyway, this was really exciting for me, and I wanted to share this with all these people that uh, I'd been developing code with. So I put a toolkit out there with a lot of um, explanations of how to get it running and kind of some inspirational material to show people how cool I thought it looked. And uh, it was amazing to see, uh, again, this discussion, like the 80% coming back. You know, I put the 20% out there and then there was the 80% coming back at me. People were posting dance videos, um, some like uh, title credits, or what is it called? Titles. A lot of music videos. I even worked on some. It's a local band. Does anyone know this band? <laughs> so this is actually the first time I came to Toronto was to shoot that video. One of the guys was like playing guitar for a solo and uh, <laughs> the way that the scanner works is that it projects these lines that go really fast, strobe effect. And he, did, he wasn't expecting it because he was the first one. So he steps up there with his guitar. He's like, all right, I'm ready. And then we start the projector and he's just, whoa. He's like, this is like doing drugs. <laughs> so funny. Um, Steering is... Uh, yeah, so it was amazing. Again, for at least the 20% and I found this huge, massive creativity coming back at me um, that was more than I could ever create by myself in different directions than I could ever imagine. Um, the next toolkit I worked on was for face tracking Steering is... uh, called uh, face OSC, it was a simple app, it's or it's a simple app, it's still available, that you can download and uh, get running on um, Mac and Windows and Linux really quickly, and it just takes the camera input from your computer and starts doing kind of really high resolution face tracking on it. You know, it, it tracks all these different points all around your face and watches how the mesh deforms, and it tries to give you these features that are extracted about, you know, how open is your jaw, or how raised are your eyebrows, um, you know, what's the shape of your mouth, and uh, once you have face OSC running, you can kind of route that into another application, a lot of different applications except OSC, um, which is just a kind of network-based um, communications format. Uh, and you can also send it from OSC to MIDI and then start controlling music. And anyway, I was just trying to make something that was as accessible as possible. It didn't require writing any code or anything. Just, you know, if you're familiar with the idea of OSC, maybe you're a musician, maybe you're doing something else with Open Sound Control, then you can plug into it. And people started, again, making tons of crazy stuff, controlling. Uh, um, paper airplane with their face as it flies around, typing with a keyboard using the, you know, the place that they look on the screen to control that. Um, Andy Clymer was doing this kind of typography exercises. <laughs> like, what is a, what does your face expression look like as a font? 
I really like this one. So she just raised her eyebrows and then it says, check your Twitter. And then she goes, looks at Twitter. <laughs> it says, tweet with your brow, bro. This guy's making some noise, kind of, like I said, just not writing any code, just using this app called Oscillator to route the OSC into MIDI and then to Ableton Live. So I hope one day all DJing is done this, this way. <laughs> and that was just the beginning. That was like after you know, the first week or something. And then over the next year, I started seeing even more. You know, there were people integrating Face OSC into their curriculum, um, making weird animations. Greg Borenstein, who's here, he was you know, showing how to, how to confuse Face OSC into believing that a face is there. Um, sisters making... Uh, games for each other, like she was making a game for her little sister that was about eating letters on the screen. Um, yeah, tracking your emotions over the course of the day, something about Arnold Schwarzenegger, um, <laughs> moving physical objects like with your face, moving the servo around using your eyebrows, it just keeps going. It's like, again, stuff I would never have thought of uh, or just wouldn't have had the time to make. Uh, I guess the, the theme there is that when you work with when you work with a bunch of amateurs, so amateur means like you do it because you love it, the ama is coming from like the same word that's used for amor in Spanish, it's for love. Uh, we think of it as like amateur versus professional, like you pay, you get paid or you don't get paid, but I like calling all these people amateurs because you can tell they're doing it because they love it and they're putting that, you know, 80% back into it when you doing that 20% because you love it um, are, uh, are just kind of kicking it off. Um, so. Another group of people I like to do it with are my friends. <laughs> um, back in 2008, the way that I got introduced to Open Frameworks was through something called Open Frameworks Lab at uh, Ars Electronica, which is a festival that happens, uh, Ars is a festival that happens every year in Linz in Austria. Um, and uh, for OF Lab, this was like this one year OF was kind of being recognized as being an interesting force in the media arts community. So they said, we want you to bring maybe 15 people from across the world to come work in this space for like a week. And we said, all right, we're gonna build a three-story scaffolding structure and we're gonna just hang out for like 24 hours a day in the second floor and people can come by and stop stop by and give us ideas and then we'll make those ideas. And the ideas were like five words basically. So you would give us five words and you can see these like pictures hanging up over here. These are people holding up whiteboards that have the five words on them. And we would take one and we'd say, oh, this is a good one. And then we'd sit down and we'd spend three hours making it. So these were some of like the OF hackers that were working there. And one of them, this guy here, this is Arturo Castro. And uh, he's coming from Barcelona at the time. Um, so this is the first time that I met him. He's one of the main contributors to OF. Um, he's a really good programmer and really kind, creative guy. Uh, a few years later, after you know, we've been getting to know each other and uh, working on, I'm working on face tracking, he's working on other graphics stuff, he sends me this video <laughs> that looks like this. And he says, hey Kyle, I've been thinking about maybe blending faces while we're tracking them. Uh, what do you think? <laughs> I said, this is, I just wrote back and was like, this is insane. And then I, I wasn't sure what to do. And I waited like a month trying to figure out what to do. And then he was like, well, I'm just going to post this video. So, <laughs> so he posted the video and I was like, oh no, now I have to do something. So I dug through his code and I tried to figure out if I could make it better or more accurate or something so that we could take it farther. So I s tried to work on the shaders a bit. <laughs> Make it, make it a little more accurate, kind of make it run a little faster. Um, and we kind of kept developing the code together to make it uh, more and more robust. Maybe it, I don't know, maybe it works right now. Ah. <laughs> oh, it's got one side of the face is confused. Yeah, so I've got, now that I'm missing my beard, but I got tattoos. <laughs> 
So uh, yeah, we kept working on it, developing it further, and eventually turned it into an installation where um, every time someone walked up to the installation, their face would be replaced, but only after they blinked. So whenever you blinked, you would see a new face after you opened your eyes, and it would be so fast that you would be like, what, what a second, that's, that's not me, or that wasn't who I was a second ago. <laughs> this kid's got it figured out. He's like, new person, new person. <laughs> <laughs> this is like a deep philosophical statement. It's like, I'm always a new person. I'm always a new person. Um, <laughs> yeah, we did some variations of that and explored more with face track. I explored more with face tracking ideas with other people. So this is Zach Lieberman in the back. He was also there at OF Lab. And we're working, we worked together to do some stuff with like uh, music and rhythm and collage. It's way harder than you would expect. <laughs> but if you try really hard, you can kind of do it. Let's see, I think I got it here. <laughs> Just think of it like a drum solo, okay. <laughs> so uh, the next kind of uh, project I was doing with a friend after that, which was still involving faces. I've been on a face thing for a few years, I guess. Um, was with Matt Metz called Blind Self Portrait. And it, actually, I think last year, I brought it here to FITC um, and uh, had a chance for a lot of people to, to, had a chance to share it with a lot of people here. So the idea was it was this box that Matt and I collaborated on where you would rest your hand on it and there would be this computer watching you, tracking your face, and then creating this outlined image of your face. And then once you closed your eyes, your hand would start drawing yourself without your volition, right? So the, the box is just moving your hands and then you're holding the pen. So you end up being the kind of final actor in this complex series of uh, computational exchanges. You're just being used by the machine, basically. But you're being used to make something that you could never make by yourself. You know, it's a portrait that you can never draw with your eyes closed, because of course you can't draw a portrait of yourself with your eyes closed. Um, <laughs> uh, this, one, this one I actually did by myself, but it was based on an idea from a friend who will come up in a second. Oh, hold on, hold on. I gotta start that one again. You have to hear it. Hell breezy. Let me show you how to keep the dice rolling when you're doing that thing over there, homie. Hey, 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 hey. Let's go! I'm feeling like I'm running and I'm feeling like I gotta get away, get away, get away. Better know that I don't and I won't ever stop because you know I gotta wait. So, <laughs> so, <laughs> thanks. Uh, so that was based on an idea from a friend, uh, Jonas Yongyan. He was showing me, he was like, Kyle, I've been playing with compression a lot recently. And when I use compression the wrong way, everything gets stretched. And if I use it doubly the wrong way, it gets exaggerated. So we kind of hacked together what it would look like to, um, or sorry, I hacked together what it would look like to do the thing he was doing, but only that thing. He was doing like a really glitchy version and it looked amazing, but it didn't look as subtle. And I, was, I wanted something a little more natural. Um, yeah. Here, actually, I want to show you him. He's over here. No, that's Jonas Lund. Yeah, so this was us working on another project together. We were in um, uh, Denmark. Sorry, this is him over here. <laughs> um, it works really well with his hair because it'll kind of bounce around and just go woof, woof, woof. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I'll, I'll get back to this project in a second. OK, uh, different one, not faces anymore. Um, I was talking with Inmi here for a few years about language. We were just emailing each other. She saw some of my work and I saw some of her work. We started this email exchange over like a year, thanks, um, saying, you know, uh, we're interested in the way that uh, writing works and sound works and language works and we're interested in uh, sound visualization and we wanted to do something physical and we were seeing all these sculptures that were 3D printed and we thought, we want it. I want to 3D print something, we want to 3D print something. Um, <laughs> kind of like a naive excitement about a new medium, I guess, but um, we really wanted to push ourselves to make something that didn't look like all of the other 
pine cone shaped things that we saw. Um, sorry, if anybody makes pine cone shaped things. Um, uh, and we decided, well, the best way that we could figure out to visualize a sound was by looking at the way that humans already visualize spoken language, which is, well, like right now I'm doing this with my hands, right? This is saying something about my inflection and like this, this was like something. This is somethingness, you know, I just made the something gesture. Um, uh, we wanted to kind of extract some of these gestures that we use for sounds uh, that are kind of just barely outside of our linguistic context. So what we did is we did a bunch of interviews with people where uh, we asked them, you know, what does this word sound like? But it was a language they didn't understand. So, uh, you know, it was an English speaker and we would share a word in Korean um, and they would say, well, it sounds kind of like, and then they'd make some gesture with their hands and we'd record that with a, with a connect and then we'd extrude it over time um, and we'd create these sculptures from those extruded, um, uh, extruded gestures. And this was like, basically, you know, this is what happens when you spend like two years having intermittent email exchange with someone about <laughs> what, what does language mean? What is sound? What is, what is the visual representation of sound? Um, you can come up with some of these really strange things, again, that I feel like I wouldn't have come up with by myself, but she has a different background than me and vice versa. And uh, so I'm coming more from like this 3D technical computer science thing. And then she's coming more from this poetic, linguistic writing thing. And it meets in the middle somewhere to make something more interesting than what either of us could have made. This is Lisa. So this is Lisa in New York, Lisa Corey. Um, she's another friend I was working with on another idea that was kind of completely independent from how I normally think. She's really interested in clothing and manufacturing and she spent a lot of time as a, um, what is it called when you make shoes? Cobbler, nice, thanks. So she was working as a cobbler for a while and uh, she was like an expert at like sewing the shoes together and, and she wanted to figure out a way to make um, dresses in a way that was kind of more democratic and open source. Uh, and then we reduced that concept to just being about jeans <laughs> because dresses are really hard to make and jeans aren't quite as bad. So we worked together to combine again, like for me, this kind of technical 3D sensing computer vision side and then her, she had this, a little more of this aesthetic and uh, kind of clothing backgrounds. And we were both interested in the kind of political nature of this, of like, what does it mean to try and dismantle the clothing industry? Which, of course, you know, can never quite meet that goal. But um, yeah, this was a project we made together called OpenFit about a year ago, um, where we wrote some software in processing that was getting data from Open Frameworks, which was connected to a Connect. Um, <clears throat> and we had a party with like about we invited 60 friends and we made, I think, six pairs of jeans over two hours with like our assembly line of seamstresses. Uh, yeah, it was really fun. And I think um, we both learned a lot about, you know, what you can actually do uh, when you get someone who's studying a sort of traditional craft and someone who's studying a sort of, well, she was studying this traditional craft, like, you know, reading lots of books about pattern making. And then I was studying kind of a newer craft, which was reading lots of books about computer vision. <laughs> and when you get those two perspectives together, you can have this friendship that creates something really interesting. Mm -hmm. Okay, another one. So uh, last year, at this conference called IO, I gave a talk called Free Ideas, where I just said as many ideas as I could in the 45 minutes of time that I had. <laughs> I shared everything I was thinking about and what I wanted to make and do. And uh, one of the ideas was this. I said, you know, wouldn't it be interesting if we had a, a lamp or a, a light bulb? Um, sorry, I said, wouldn't it be interesting if we had a small object that just tweeted conversations that were in public spaces? <laughs> and uh, someone in the audience who is a friend of mine, Brian House, uh, he came up to me afterwards and he said, yeah, it would be interesting. <laughs> we should do it. <laughs> I said, great, let's do it. And he took the lead on making this small uh, kind of Raspberry Pi device. Um, here, you can see it at the beginning, actually. Well, I'll go there. I'll go back in a second. He, um, 
He took the lead on this small Raspberry Pi device that just had a microphone and connected to whatever wireless network it could, and then it would record audio snippets and upload them to Mechanical Turk to be transcribed and then posted to Twitter. Um, <laughs> and we kind of, you know, deployed it around New York City, and <laughs> I never found out. He recorded this video, and I never found out where this is, actually. <laughs> but I'm, I'm hoping it's his bedroom. <laughs> Uh, but I didn't ask him, and I kind of don't want to know. So yeah, the stream is full of a ton of stuff, and um, we we made this like a, maybe six months ago, but uh, we just released it um, about a week ago because we needed to really finish the documentation, which you're seeing now, and uh, kind of fine tune some things. Um, but this is something. This is an interesting example for me because I think, let's see, it wouldn't have been. I'm not sure I would have done this by myself. Like, it's kind of, it was an exciting idea and it was interesting to me, but I kind of wanted to work on it with someone. And not because, like, I couldn't handle it technically or because it, you know, uh, I, I don't know quite how to say it, but it was like, I wanted someone to bounce the ideas off of uh, that could have kind of a conflicting viewpoint, someone that could, like, balance me back. And, you know, I guess with this, I was worried I would have a tendency to do something really terrible. <laughs> and uh, it turned out he actually just had a tendency to do it even more terrible. But, <laughs> um, but we balanced each other in other ways, and I thought that was really, that was really great. Um, OK. So a completely different kind of space. Th these are kind of the two longest ones, so the, the rest will go a little faster, I think. But um, this idea of like followers, I wish I had a picture of like what my followers look like, but it's kind of impossible because it's this amorphous collection of like uh, some, some people you don't really have a relationship in some way or because it's unidirectional, it's not the same as other relationships. Um, but I've been trying to understand what, is that, what does that relationship look like between you and kind of the mass of people out there or people who are interested in you specifically. Um, the first project that I did in that direction was called Key Tweeter. Uh, this was in 2009. Uh, I had a key logger that I wrote, which is a program that records every keystroke you make. Um, and it posted everything I wrote to Twitter after every 140th character. It just posted a tweet. So you would get things like, um, well, this was the last one. Oh, I guess it's the, the end of the piece. It's been a year. I, I did it for a year. Um, so, well, I guess that's it. So that was the last one. But you can, if you go back through, you can see, you know, some code. Um, you can see writing, you know, talk, chatting with someone, more code. There's some processing in there. I think there was a little bit of an email somewhere at the bottom. Um, uh, but that was like the first experiment where I started to feel like, oh, I think I'm starting to get a feeling for it was the first experiment where I started to get a feeling for what that relationship meant between me and like people who were interested in me, but not necessarily my friends. Um, and then more recently, uh, I, I did this experiment or this piece called Going Public, right when Twitter launched its IPO and became a publicly held company. Um, I decided I was going to open source my Twitter account, basically. Th there was this thing I'd been wanting to do for a while, which was like explore what happens when uh, you kind of lose your identity online. The there's something weird about like <laughs> about our body and our mind, right? They're attached to each other. We can't really separate our, our mind from our body, except maybe with like certain substances. But uh, most of the time, it doesn't happen. Um, but online, there's no such separation between like who you are sort of in your mind and who you are online. Uh, sorry, there can be a separation between those two things. Um, there's no such necessity of connection between the two. The only thing that necessarily connects your identity up here to like who you are online is a password most of the time. Um, and if someone knows that password, they can be you. There's nothing stopping them. So I really wanted to figure out what would it look like? Maybe if I just give my password to a few friends and they can kind of be me. Uh, but I couldn't figure it out for a long time. And then I started talking with uh, Lauren McCarthy a lot um, about some of these issues around identity online and in person and uh, realized that there would be a way to kind of accept any sort of person who wanted to be me without giving them my password. And that was just when they sent me a direct message, uh, it would automatically post it to my account. 
Um, so these were all people who were sending me direct messages and <laughs> posting that, and it would post as me to my account. I really like this one because uh, this person was kind of <laughs> riffing off of the idea that there's a lot of projects that I've done that involve some mixture of uh, fakery, <laughs> and they were thinking that you know maybe I was just sitting there at my computer copying and pasting the direct messages all day. Um, fortunately, I didn't have to, and it would have been very tiring because I think in the end there were about 3,000 messages over the course of one month that I was doing it. Um, <laughs> some people were posting pictures. Some of them were kind of inappropriate, but whatever, I left it up there. And it was interesting to feel like, you know, now I was this new person. I wasn't just me as I've been, but I was actually somehow represented by this crowd of people who could kind of be acting through me or acting as me. Um, it was a really weird feeling, and I got kind of freaked out in the middle about like if I'd lost myself online. It kind of felt like I was disconnected from my body or something, like the feeling of when, maybe when like your arm, your leg dies or something, what is it? not dies, what is it? when your leg like, uh, yeah, falls asleep. If your leg falls asleep when you're sitting down, it kind of felt like my Twitter fell asleep, right? Like it was like, uh, something's weird, something's wrong, it's uncomfortable, I can't quite put my finger on it, I want to kind of make something happen, but I can't do anything about it. Um, it was a really weird feeling. I think there's, and since this kind of relationship is so new, the idea of like followers that anyone can have, you know, we're all kind of mini celebrities now. Um, because this relationship exists, we're, I think, just starting to figure out about some of these weird things that can happen there. Um, and so hopefully with some of these projects like Going Public and KeyTweeter, I can kind of start digging into what's possible in that space. Um, yeah, okay, art institutions. One of my favorite categories. <laughs> uh, the first residency I ever had was at a place called Studio for Creative Inquiry um, at Carnegie Mellon, which is organized by Golan Levin. This is Golan. Uh, <laughs> we're getting lunch together, and uh, this is what happens when you get lunch with a nerd. Um, you start writing out computer vision algorithms on your lunchbox. <laughs> um, uh, so, Working in that space, it looked something like this. Um, it was basically the most sort of emotional, intellectual, technical support I've ever received in one spot at the same time. Um, Golan was there to bounce ideas off of, he was there to you know, collaborate with, and he had the craziest cache of technology to play with ever. Um, this is one thing that we were playing with, which was a really high resolution infrared camera. And we had this special infrared ring of LEDs around it, which gave you this um, reflection in your pupils that looks like, looks like this. It's called retro reflection. We also know it as like a red eye effect when you use a flash. And we use this effect to create a piece together um, called eye shine, which looked like this. The idea is that when you walk into this space, it starts recording your pupils to a database, and then it amasses the collection of you know, hundreds of people's pupils who have walked through this space, and it looks kind of like a forest of creatures. You can get a feeling of like what each person's character is like by watching them kind of bounce around. Golan's done a lot of stuff with eyes as well in his previous work, so it's fun to like go in, you know, to, to to meet with someone who is, you know, has such a huge breadth of uh, knowledge and uh, kind of practice behind them and kind of let that rub off on you and try and learn something from it. Uh, it can be really inspiring. So another place I did a longer residency at was called YCAM in Japan, uh, Yamaguchi Center for Arts and Media. Um, these are some of the fellows there, thanks. and. Uh, or sorry, these are some of the people who work at YCAM, uh, a lot of good friends. Um, we would go out drinking basically every weekend and then the next day everyone would look like this <laughs> because you party really hard in Japan. <laughs> you know, you, go, you, you leave work at midnight and then you go drink for like four hours and then you get back at 10 a.m. the next day. <laughs> um, uh, and they're amazing people. They kind of gave me that same sort of technical, spiritual, emotional support that I was getting from Golan at Studio for Creative Inquiry. Um, and I think it really, one of the reasons it happens in 
at uh, YCAM so strongly is because it's kind of in the middle of nowhere. It's not like in Tokyo or something. It's a really small city and uh, no one lives there. So uh, they have to kind of support each other a lot because they're doing something kind of weird for that space. So while I was there, I kind of developed some more 3D and projection mapping techniques, um, stuff that I couldn't have really done elsewhere. Um, and uh, a lot of interactive projection mapping, especially. I made some new tools for doing projection mapping. One's called Mapamuck, uh, like, like this, Mapamuck. Um, and it's a tool for like really quickly calibrating a scene. So you just click on a few points um, on your projected image, and uh, you can kind of line up a 3D model and start doing um, some kind of classic projection mapping effects. Uh, let's see. Yeah, lots of experiments with things like, you know, what happens when you have two projectors projecting on the same spot and then you calibrate them together so they're pixel for pixel, you know, aligned with each other and you use the negative space. Uh, stuff like this you can't really do in a really busy city because, you know, your stuff's always getting taken down and put back up and you don't have the headspace to, like, just focus on something for a long period of time. Um, so there's something special in places like YCAM. Uh, mm, I don't have much time left, so I want to get through the last few of these really fast. Uh, let's see, what are the most important ones? Mm. Okay, festivals. There's some cool festivals out there. I really like it when festivals sponsor new artworks, just to kind of have them around to show people. <laughs> um, this was called EXR3 with a friend, Elliot Woods. Um, this is Elliot looking like he's in a star field. Uh, the idea was you would stand in different spots in the room and you would see different images on these mirrors. So in one spot you'd see a circle, in another spot you'd see a red line, in another spot you'd see this yellow square, and it was all kind of embedded throughout the space. Elliot has kind of a similar way of thinking to me. So unlike some of the previous people I mentioned, Elliot thinks really, we think really similarly to each other. And what that ends up doing is it just kind of amplifies how much you can go in one direction, and that can be interesting too. Um, same thing with Jonas. He also thinks kind of similarly. So we worked on this project called Light Leaks Together. I mentioned him earlier. He was the one who had the idea for this caricature, you know, face stretching idea. Um, so we made this uh, project in Helsingor in uh, northern Denmark. Um, and the idea was we projected with three projectors onto 50 disco balls and we mapped every single reflection in the room using computer vision so it was automatic. Um, and then we could control every reflection like a 3D pixel in space. Um, and uh, it becomes like an, the whole room becomes like an arbitrary display surface. And we're still exploring this idea some more because um, it was kind of like a mini residency. We just had the chance to develop the idea and not enough time to kind of explore all of the feelings that you could get from this medium. Uh, Jonas Lund, social world, okay, let me see. The last thing I did most least recently was I was at Resonate Festival in Belgrade, working with this guy, <laughs> Klaus Obermeier. <laughs> this is Cevapcici, this is a very special uh, Serbian dish. <laughs> and also with Daito Manabe, this guy right here. <laughs> this is our boy band between, <laughs> <laughs> between uh, Jono and me and, and Daito. Uh, so we were working on a new dance piece, basically, that was, let's see, we were working on a new dance piece that was involving some weird ways of tracking dancers and then kind of, uh, like, doing strange things to their body. Like, <laughs> um, yeah, trying to, like, do some stuff that feels a little weird, but you're not really sure why. So maybe if she's still, then it feels kind of okay, but then she starts moving, and you're not really sure what's going on. And then some stuff that's just obviously wrong. <laughs> so we were doing that in this performative, uh, like, this theater environment. Daito was doing some face stimulation stuff. Um, so this is a piece we're still developing, but that was sponsored by a festival also. Um, corporations. Sometimes corporations sponsor work. <laughs> it's a little rare. The place where I really like working with corporations is when they decide, you know, you'll you'll have a <laughs> you'll have some really hard technical problem to solve, and you can tell them, okay, I'll solve your technical problem, but only if we get to open source the solution. So this was a situation where I did that. Um, I they wanted to 
uh, use LIDAR, like a laser scanner, to do tracking in front of this window where when people put their hand in front of the window, the you know, jewelry case opened to reveal you know, a million dollar diamond or something, um, <laughs> which is kind of, anyway, kind of amazing. But uh, the, my goal there was like to basically make a library for this scanner a sick laser scanner and make it something that we could share with people and we did it was the same situation as like the face tracking and the 3d scanning uh, we had a chance to make a tool that other people are using for their interactive installations now um, let's see all right I'm gonna finish with a couple projects I've been working on recently um, so do it with someone you love does anyone work with someone they love few people? Ah, oh, that's great. All right, so like 10 people. So I love Lauren McCarthy. She was just talking yesterday. And uh, I met her while she was working on this project called Social Turkers. Uh, I was not actually on a date with her at the time, but I was watching the live stream. And it's really weird to watch someone go on a date before you go on a date with them. <laughs> But uh, it was good because then I knew her style, you know, I could, <laughs> I had a leg up. Um, the first project we worked on together was called Friend Flop. Uh, it just takes people in your Twitter stream and it swaps their identities. Um, so you get Bill Gates saying, West Coast, you watching Keeping Up with the Kardashians? Um, or this is probably my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> Really simple identity experiment. And then, uh, did anyone, who saw Lauren's doc? Okay, a bunch of people. All right, so check out this project, Us Plus, if you haven't seen it. <laughs> um, she didn't talk about this one, though, which is called Noodle. Um, I wanted to show this picture because it's on the Instructables homepage. Isn't that awesome? After like five years ago, working on Instructables being a big part of my development. Like, personally, it, it, it's really exciting. So Noodle was this little device it looked like it looked like this. Um, it's about this big, and it's a machine. Uh, it's a device with the uh, the inputs and outputs of a machine, but the heart and the soul of a human being. And the reason it has that is because it's basically a body for mechanical Turk workers. The idea is that you program it by filling out this form that is exposed via the device. So it connects to your wireless network. Um, you type in its address and. Um, uh, you just fill out this form that says something like, okay, Noodle, when the audio detects, you know, when the audio detects a loud noise, first use the camera to take a photo, then answer a question, you know, is this person scary, and then do something like play a sound or show a picture. Um, and uh, yeah, so it was kind of a general purpose tool for giving a body to mechanical Turk workers. Um, it looks something like this on the inside, and uh, we used it to automate a bunch of different tasks, you know watch out for the people coming into the office, um, keep watch over the, over the electrical outlet, you know, watch people who are doing the dishes, <laughs> it's all different sorts of things. Um, and uh, yeah, I think this is something we're still thinking about more is like how to deal with this weird situation between the internet and our body and our mind and our identity. Um, yeah. Okay, I think I'm basically out of time, and there is, let's see, should I show this, or you probably might have seen this already. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say one last thing. <laughs> uh, this last category, like really everyone, everyone, do it with everyone. Um, Something I've been thinking about a lot is uh, online communities like GitHub, um, people who are being creative together, um, and how we're supporting each other. While I was in Japan doing that residency, uh, I read this book that a friend gave me about Japanese tea house. And it said, uh, it's a history of the Japanese tea house, Japanese tea culture. Um, and it said about the tea house that um, the tea houses were only there temporarily, that they got torn down really quickly after they were built, um, or they just weren't expected to last very long. And it made a comparison to the body. It said, the body itself is but a hut in the wilderness, a flimsy shelter made by tying together the grasses that grew around. When these ceased to be bound together, they became resolved into their original waste. Um, there were a bunch of interesting things going on with the, uh, with the tea house, like this little door you have to kind of lean into. So this is smaller than a person, basically. Samurai has to take their sword off so that they can kind of not uh, cause danger to people. Everyone should be equal inside. Everyone has to kind of bow to go inside. So there's this 
kind of difficult entrance way. Sometimes I feel that way about Git or GitHub or other tools. Like there's kind of steep learning curve sometimes. Everyone has to go through it once and you can kind of relate to each other because of that. Um, you know, if someone's a samurai, leaves his sword on the rack beneath the eaves, the tea room being preeminently the house of peace. Um, and then finally, inside the tea room, you've got this space where uh, there's almost nothing there. Um, the house is coming down. <laughs> uh, there's almost nothing there. There's basically a scroll, some flowers, and the teapot. And the idea is, unlike a sort of Western space, it's not overly decorated. There's only a few details. And as a, someone joining the space, you're supposed to kind of complete the picture of the space in your own mind. Um, and I feel like, uh, again, this is like what, what's going on with these online communities. We start a little bit, maybe putting that 20% out there, but then the people who join in, they're the people who complete these spaces. And the best example I've seen of this was uh, something, again, while I was in Japan, we were working with these wireless sensors that told us position and orientation. I was doing really technical research saying, you know, how do you, how do you get um, the absolute position of this sensor over time? Digging really deeply into this and trying to find more info about it. This guy, Fabio Verrazano, he was an Italian developer, and he was the one that was making this. And I saw, um, you know, he had some notes online about getting this absolute position. And I found a post that said, uh, you know, hey, Fabio, can you help me out with this? I was following it through, following it through. And then finally, I get to this post a few pages later that says, I'm sorry, like, Fabio's, Fabio just died. He's only 27, but, you know, he's, he's not around anymore. Um, and I'm reading through these posts, and I see the next one says, oh, we'll miss him so much. You know, I just wishing lots of good things for him. And then the next page, this is the next, very next thing. <laughs> Someone just says, oh, you know, hey, maybe there's a way to change the vendor ID. Maybe we can patch the firmware. And it's just like continuation of the same thread. You know, the, the guy who was responsible for this huge project that was involved with this chip that a ton of people were using for drone projects, for motion sensing projects, he just, you know, he disappears. He's, he's just not alive anymore um, from this kind of tragic incident. And uh, the the community recovers. It's bigger than any one of us. It's something that we're all kind of in together and we each put in our little bit and then everyone gives us that, that extra bit back. Um, so thank you very much for listening. Thanks.